Okay, perfect. So let's begin. The first thing we're going to talk about is some of our acute hematological conditions, okay? Um, really, we're focusing on about two or three, and we're going to break them apart. All right, so what is our first thing that we kind of got to be thinking about when we think hematologic? We think blood. What do we think blood? Lab values. Lots and lots of lab values we're going to be looking at. We're also going to talk about differentiating between the different types of thrombocytopenia and finally general safety considerations um, that involve the nurse because while in nursing school we do not kind of work with blood products or anything like that um, it is the role of the registered nurse to know how to safely transfuse blood safely administer blood licensed practical nurses cannot um, work with blood products. It's the role of the nurse, and we're going to focus on what exactly are these roles we have. Okay, so first thing we're going to talk about is our sickle cell crisis. Now, this is kind of when it becomes an emergency. So way back in patho, we learned about sickle cell anemia, which is an autosomal recessive disorder. Now, it's a chronic issue. But what happens when a chronic issue becomes an acute emergency? And that's what we focus on. So what are some risk factors that kind of swing us from chronic condition to acute emergency? Well, usually in times of dehydration, high altitudes, stress is a big one. And remember, the body doesn't know between stress from my upcoming exam versus a stress because I just ran a marathon, okay? Just stress in general. Unfortunately, though, this has major complications, including our acute chest syndrome, can damage the organs, because um, when you really think about it, these blood cells sickle, and they can't travel to where they need to go, so some of our organs may not get um, the oxygen and the nutrition they need simply because the red blood cells have sickled and won't fit if you kind of get where I'm going, they won't fit through the pathway um, because they're not kind of uh, slim and, and smooth anymore, okay? So lots and lots of pain these patients have, and you might actually see some stroke-like symptoms um, when these, these cells sickle because really depending where they sickle, they can kind of impede blood flow to an area and, and really cause lots of issues. Um, so, what do we see a lot in these sickle cell patients? We see a really low hematocrit. Now, why in the world do we see a low hematocrit? Well, remember, when our blood cells sickle, they're not good anymore. And when we have no good red blood cells, the body kind of attacks them and breaks them down so that they can be excreted. That's why these patients have a high bilirubin. Bilirubin is a byproduct of the breakdown of red blood cells. So that's really what's happening. You got a lot going on with these patients. I really, really like to use the phrase hop to it when you're taking care of a patient um, in sickle cell crisis. You hydrate, you oxygenate, and you give pain. Why? These patients will be at 10 out of 10 pain. Therefore, we're not going to give them Tylenol. We're not going to give them acetaminophen. We're probably going to give them Dilaudid and morphine. Okay? For this first few you know, hours, maybe one to two days, we're going to give them high dose, high strength pain meds because it will be 10 out of 10. Hydroxyurea also can be used for these patients. However, it is a immunomodulator type drug, so it puts them at risk for infection. It actually causes a decreased immunity, so that's something to keep in mind. Also, um, penicillin can help with preventing infection, um, and finally, transfusions. Sometimes these patients just will require um, a transfusion of HBA. Why? Well, this disease is caused by HBS, meaning the hemoglobin, the cell of the hemoglobin carries the sickled trait. So we kind of need to balance out our sickled cells versus our normal cells, okay? Additionally, uh, we nebulize oxygen. Why do we do this? We're just gonna um, hydrate, sorry, hydrate the oxygen, if that makes sense, because they're very, very dehydrated. So a big patient education is going to be how to mitigate those risk factors. High altitudes probably aren't the best. Drink lots of water, things like that. 
but also we know that these patients are at risk for infection, so get those vaccines, especially the pneumonia vaccine, okay, and really just prevent kind of these, these situations. Up next, we have polycythemia vera, which just means we have a lot of red blood cells. What happens when we have a lot of red blood cells? Our blood gets very, very viscous. Well, when it's really viscous and really, really thick, it can clog and it can clot, okay? Really, really bad because we're at risk for stroke, we're at risk for tons of tons of issues. And unfortunately, even with treatment, um, which is gonna be your apheresis, even with treatment, the life expectancy isn't, isn't very um, long. Okay. These patients will have an increased hemoglobin and all those signs and symptoms associated with, you know, having just mass amounts of excess blood, including hypertension, thrombosis, bleeding issues, etc. Really, the only thing for polycythemia there is going to be your apheresis, where we go in and we, we pull out some of those extra red blood cells, okay? And what do we do when we're trying to prevent clots, things like that? We want to promote venous return. So that's using our um, SCDs, that's using our compression garments, etc. Up next, we have our thrombocytopenia. And we're going to talk about the different types of thrombocytopenia. But in general, when caring for a patient with thrombocytopenia, regardless of what the type is, um, we really need to understand that they are at massive risk for bleeds. So our focus as a nurse is going to be keeping these patients safe, okay? How do we do that? Well, we use electric razors. We're not going to be sticking them five million times. We're going to teach them not to play contact sports. And if their platelet count gets less than 10,000, um, or even um, I've seen it less than 20,000 in the clinical setting, but if their count is kind of less than that 10 to 20,000, um, if I'm correct, NCLEX likes 20, but um, just go by what your professor wants. Um, we, we do a platelet transfusion for these patients. Um, we can also do a splenectomy because if you kind of think about it, the spleen's involved in that whole production process. Um, what are we going to see in a patient that has any sort of thrombocytopenia? You're probably going to see lots of bleeding, some rash, bruising everywhere, um, etc. And how do we differentiate the types of thrombocytopenia? Well, it's kind of depending on, on what's causing the thrombocytopenia. For example, our autoimmune idiopathic thrombocytopenia, this is an autoimmune issue where my body attacks platelets. That's what's going to cause the very low platelet count. Um, again, like we talked about, our main concern is bleeds, okay? Um, additionally, we know this is an autoimmune issue, so how do we treat autoimmune problems? We would treat it with um, immunosuppressants, steroids are immunosuppressants, corticosteroids. We can also give IVIG and IV anti-Rho to help as well. Um, additionally, Chemo drugs can also be used um, for these patients, but I focus more on your kind of corticosteroids, okay? Up next, we have TTP, which is our thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. This occurs usually after surgery. Now, why in the world does this happen? Well, essentially, my body just goes into overdrive trying to form clots, okay? They form a bunch of clots in places that they don't even need to form clots. And what essentially happens is it uses up all of, um, not really all of the, the um, platelets, but um, really we've got lots. It, it's, it's in response to surgery. So if your patient had abdominal surgery, if they had sutures in place, the body kind of goes into overdrive. And we really see this, this loss of circulating platelets. And we just see these plugs kind of forming everywhere. This is why usually we'll see some ischemic tissue. Why do we see ischemic tissue? Well, if I had a clog or a, a clot somewhere, that area distal is going to have lots of, lots of problems. And these kind of clogs form everywhere. 
So what are we going to do? Um, we're going to try to give some antiplatelet medications to loosen up the clots, um, hopefully so that we can send them somewhere helpful, like, hey, platelets, you're not needed right there, but you know where they are needed? Somewhere else. So that's why we give some antiplatelets to help. Um, additionally, fresh frozen plasma can be given, and we'll talk about that in the um, um, transfusion portion of, of this lecture, okay? And then now we have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is just an allergic reaction to heparin. If someone has thrombocytopenia any time up to 100 days after getting heparin, it's going to be heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Remember, heparin is an anticoagulant. It's, it's what we give patients in the short term to help them um, not get clots or anything like that. It's given to a lot of our stroke patients, myocardial infarction patients, et cetera. Um, it's going to basically help blood squeeze where it needs to go a little bit better. Okay. What can we give for these patients? We can give them some argotrobin. Okay. So when we're talking about the different types of thrombocytopenia, I just want you guys to have a good understanding of what causes it and how we treat it but you're also really um, expected more to know these general thrombocytopenia nursing considerations, okay? Which are gonna be your risk for bleeds. Now we have DIC. And essentially DIC is a nightmare. Usually your patients that are septic or had sepsis are at really big risk for DIC. What happens is that my body uses up all my clotting factors pretty rapidly, usually in response to some severe situation going on in the body that really sends my body into overdrive, whether it's sepsis, burns, trauma, a transfusion reaction, venom, my body gets so freaked out, it causes massive clotting. And then I've ran out of all my clotting factors I'm now going to bleed everywhere. So you'll see all this elevated D-dimer. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see increased PT-INR, meaning my patient's got a lot of clots, but if I, if I give them a paper cut, they're going to gush out of it, essentially. Um, and it's just a, a response by the body to a, a, an emergency, really. Sepsis is an emergency. Burns is an emergency. Trauma is an emergency. The body just gets overwhelmed. So it's like, you know what? Take, take, take it all. I'm just going to clot everything to try to save myself from whatever is happening. Um, but really, we know um, it, it's, it's pretty severe. What will we see? We'll see some small purplish rashes. Um, eventually, respiratory distress kind of happens. Um, why do we think respiratory distress? I'm thinking pulmonary embolism. Okay. Um, and again, you'll see red spots. You'll just see signs of clots, but also signs of bleeding, which usually we, we don't see too often. It's usually, oh, this patient has clots or, oh, they're bleeding everywhere. Because usually if your patient is on anticoagulant therapy, they're not going to have clots. So you'll see an increased PT INR, but the D-dimer should remain low. Well, with DIC, and this is how you can differentiate DIC, you've got lots of clots and lots of bleeds, which if you think about physiologically, it doesn't make sense. Why would my, why would someone have clots and still be bleeding? It's usually either or, but with DIC, we, we get all this crazy stuff happening. So we got to treat the underlying condition. If it was sepsis, treat sepsis. If it was burns, rehydrate them. Um, if it was a snake bite, give them an antivenom, but we got to treat the underlying condition first. Also probably going to give these patients fresh frozen plasma. Plasma has lots of platelets to help with that. We also give them anticoagulants to help loosen up the clots. And um, we also have what's called cryoprecipitate. This has everything we might need, including clotting factors and plasma and all the good stuff. Okay. So now we get to talk about transfusions. So um, just to go over what are some of the roles of the nurse during a transfusion and when will we give a blood transfusion? So usually in the clinical setting, if your patient has a low hemoglobin, there will be standing provider orders. Let's say if hemoglobin is less than eight, give one unit of packed red blood cells. 
that's kind of usually what you see on the day to day. But if you're working more in an ER or trauma center, you might have what's called a massive transfusion protocol, which is given when the hematocrit, the hemoglobin of hematocrit are usually dangerously low. And the whole purpose of a massive transfusion protocol, usually these patients' blood pressure is severely low. And that's kind of going to help us initiate this massive transfusion protocol, meaning they have lost fluids, they've lost volume, they've lost electrolytes, they've lost a lot of blood, a lot of oxygen. That's going to be your massive transfusion protocol, okay? Unfortunately, it's very dangerous, but we have to weigh the pros and the cons. Do we let them go into shock and let them bleed out? Or do we give them lots of blood transfusions, but know that the more blood I give them, the more chance of a transfusion reaction occurring? We'll talk about what to do during a transfusion reaction. But those are some things you kind of got to be thinking about, not only as a nurse, but when you're kind of thinking about what what kind of avenues you want to go down. So as a nurse, um, what are your roles? Well, prior to administering, you know, blood, and, and we're kind of going to talk about in the perfect world, let's say you had a patient that maybe had a GI bleed and their hemoglobin was like maybe at a seven and you had orders if it was less than eight to replenish it. Um, and you've got all the time in the world because when you're answering NCLEX style questions, you have to assume that you are in this perfect utopia, if you will. So if you had all the time in the world and all the resources, what would your role as the nurse be? And that's what you're going to be tested on. So beforehand, we're going to get the blood product consent form signed. Ideally, 72 hours prior, we're going to do a type and a cross match. Um, we're going to do some two identifiers. You have to verify with another RN. We're going to look at the blood bag, make sure it doesn't look weird. It's not green. It's not, do, you know, curdling, et cetera. And we're going to educate the patient, okay? We ideally do all of this beforehand. Now, during the procedure, we have to make sure that we use appropriate filtered tubing. Usually, this tubing will also contain some anticoagulants in it just to kind of help reduce blood clots in the tubing. Also, we have to infuse it only with normal saline. For the first 15 to 30 minutes, you stay with your patient and assess for a transfusion reaction. You're also assessing for signs and symptoms of fluid overload, and you're getting vitals. What are those fluid overload signs and symptoms we might be seeing? Um, your patient might report shortness of breath, or they might have, um, you'll usually see these altered level of consciousness quite quickly. They might become very agitated, very grumpy, very angry, um, have bounding pedal pulses, that G JVD, that jugular vein distension, et cetera. You're going to see a lot of that during. So what are the five different types of things we're probably going to be, you know, transfusing? Well, we have our packed bl uh, red blood cells. These usually are good for more your surgery or trauma. They don't have plasma. It's just red blood cells. If we just got low hemoglobin, low hematocrit, low red blood cell count. This is what we're going to give them. Um, when we're talking about platelet transfusions, this is just our platelets. Our platelets are our, um, they kind of help, again, make blood less sticky. So they're really good for patients with thrombocytopenia. Autologous blood transfusion just means it was given from themselves. Um, usually patients will do this. I know Jehovah's Witness can't accept blood products, but they can do a self-donation. So this is an option as well. Plasma transfusions. This is just blood volume and clotting factors. So it's going to help bump up their BP and also help with clot. So we see plasma transfusions a lot with traumas as well as RBCs. Um, it's important to note that with the plan plasma transfusion, it gets frozen, i.e. fresh frozen plasma FFP. We never put it in the microwave. We let it thaw. And once it's thawed, we have to infuse it. Okay. And then finally, our white blood cell transfusion. This is very rare. Usually you'll see it in a chemotherapy setting. So transfusion reactions, we can see some febrile, you know, symptoms happening, febrile meaning uh, fever, okay? If they spike a fever, um, they might have a transfusion, and these are just different types of transfusion reactions, so what, what 
what can kind of go wrong when you're doing a transfusion? Well, your patient can kind of get fever, um, meaning it's, it's more of a white blood cell issue, okay? You'll see fever, tachycardia, hypotension, etc. We talk about a hemolytic transfusion reaction. This is your traditional, they were allergic to this blood. The type and cross match was incorrect or their, their, their body's attacking this new blood, okay? You might see some severe DIC fever and chills. Allergic reaction is just common in your patients with traditional allergies, um, not as severe as your hemolytic. Bacterial, I want you to think the blood was infected with something. Okay, it wasn't fresh, it wasn't clean. Maybe the patient, maybe whoever donated had an infection that no one caught, or there was a break in sterile. Like we, we don't know, but we just know it's it's a bacterial issue. And then finally, circulatory overload, which I did talk about a little bit earlier when you gave them too much too quick. So for all of these transfusion reactions, what are what are some good things that we can do? Um, we can immediately stop the transfusion, disconnect, we flush it with normal saline. If they're having kind of allergic or hemolytic situation, we can give some diphenhydramine, IV push. Um, if they're having like that hemolytic issue with that DIC, which comes with that drop in blood pressure, um, we can do some fluid resuscitation, but really your options, um, it's just kind of up to you guys to know how to assess really what's going on with our patient and what can I do? If I notice my patient has a low blood pressure, I'm going to give them some fluid resuscitations. If they have a fever, I'm going to give them an antipyretic. Um, if their O2 stats are low, I'm going to give them some oxygen. If they're having a hemolytic reaction, I stop the infusion. That's the first thing I have to do. Okay. So um, I do have a practice question if you guys are interested in doing it. Um, this is kind of our effective, ineffective, and unrelated. Um, so effective, meaning it works. Ineffective, meaning it didn't work. And unrelated, meaning... Oh, not really pertinent to, to what's happening. So, a diagnosis one month ago, the nurse completed health promotion and wellness teaching about safety and bleeding prevention for 42-year-old female with chronic thrombocytopenia. The client returns today for a follow-up visit for lab work and assessment with the nurse before examination. So, based on what the assessment findings are. Are they effective, ineffective, or unrelated? What do we think? What do we think about the first one? That my patient lost 11 pounds in a month. Do we think that means that teaching was effective? Was it ineffective or unrelated to the situation? What do we, what do we think? E, I, or U? Yeah, yeah, so this one's unrelated. The weight gain is not, does not have anything to do with thrombocytopenia. It's unrelated. While 11 pounds in a month is a little bit concerning, it's not related to the situation, so it's unrelated. Says she switched from NSAIDs to acetaminophen for aches and pains. What do we think about that one? Should someone with thrombocytopenia switch from an NSAID to acetaminophen? What do we think about that one? We're not really concerned about the aspirin. What is a big, big, big side effect of our NSAIDs? They can do what? They can cause GI bleeds. That's what NSAIDs can do. So this one's actually effective. 
I want my patient to switch from an NSAID to a acenaminophen for aches and pains. So that means teaching was effective. What about using an electric razor? What do we think about that? Absolutely, it was effective. We want to make sure that they are using an electric razor because it's not going to cause like the little nicks that a, um, a, a regular razor would. All right. What about they now have new bruises on their fingertips when using a very old manual typewriter? What do we think about that one? Very good job, guys. That means that teaching was ineffective, that she is using something that is causing a lot of trauma to her, and she's already at this risk for bleeds. Very good. What about using a small enema to relieve occasional constipation? Effective, ineffective, unrelated. So I see some mixed, mixed um, reviews. I like where you're going, Rosie. Laxatives are probably more appropriate for this patient. Um, so this one's actually ineffective. What can a small enema do? You can risk kind of tearing some of the intestine during insertion. You could have some trauma. Absolutely, you could have some damage down there. So if they're having occasional constipation, we want to teach them maybe increase fluids, fibrous fruits, maybe take a laxative, but not an enema. An enema um, has the possibility for too much trauma if you kind of get where I'm going. And then received the seasonal influenza vaccine. What do we think about that one? I know that one can be a little bit tricky. What was the answer to the last one? Um, ineffective. The answer to the enema was ineffective. No problem. So what do we think about our patient with the the vaccine? What do we what do we think about her? So um, for this one, and I wouldn't expect you guys to know it, but our flu vaccine is actually important in. Um, preventing infections, um, which a patient with chronic thrombocytopenia, not only do they kind of have this, this lessened platelet situation, but usually with chronic thrombocytopenia, everything is also lowered. Um, so for this one, they do want to receive the influenza vaccine, but I wouldn't worry about that at all. Okay. It's just kind of going along the lines of what are if they're low with everything? Yeah, just thinking in terms of bleed. Makes sense. All right, I have another one. This one is the next gen NCLEX new version of select all that apply. So 
A 32-year-old client is being worked up because of her subjective report of extreme fatigue that has been present for three months. The nurse is doing an intake assessment. Select the assessment findings that indicate to the nurse that the patient's fatigue may be related to a hematological problem. So what do we think? What do we think? And you can just put like one, two, three, four, if you want. Um, even if you don't know, just put the ones that you do think. It's totally okay. Even if you only see one and you're like everything else, I don't know, that's totally fine. What do you think kind of may make us think that this might not just be, you know, fatigue from the flu, that this is fatigue from maybe a hematological issue? What make what might make us think that this is a blood issue? So a weight gain, I'm not really thinking blood at all. The conjunctiva are pale. Is that a normal finding or an abnormal finding? It's quite an abnormal finding, so I, I'm thinking that that there might be might be something something going on. The client's a registered nurse that works in the ED. Great for you, but that's not why I'm thinking that this is a a hematologic a blood issue. Vital signs of a heart rate of 110, a respiratory rate of 30, and a blood pressure of 94. That's a little bit odd. Why is their heart rate so high and why is their respiratory rate so high, but their blood pressure is so low? That kind of sounds like something that might happen in one of our thrombocytopenias. All right. The client's identical twin sister died of leukemia two years ago. Absolutely, that's something I need to know about. Leukemia is cancer of the blood. Client's most recent health problem was cystitis. Cystitis is a fancy word for a UTI. Again, not pertinent to this, this blood problem we're, we're suspecting. Same thing with their hobby of knitting. Again, great for you, but not pertinent to bleeding. Client takes NSAIDs for joint and muscle aches. We just talked about kind of the effect that NSAIDs can have on the body. Maybe it's a GI bleed. Maybe it's a thrombocytopenia. Who knows? But I know NSAIDs put you at risk for bleeds. That's kind of under the realm of hematologic problems. And maybe if they had a GI bleed, that's why I'm seeing those vital sign changes. Allergic with penicillin is not pertinent at all. Um, maybe an allergy to heparin would be important for us to know, but not penicillin. And then the smooth tongue, usually you do see some smooth tongue findings in certain types of anemias. So the answers are on the next screen. All right, now we get to kind of tiptoe into musculoskeletal. So really we're gonna talk about general considerations regarding you know, fractures versus sprains versus strains. What are we gonna do? What are some severe complications and some treatment options for these patients? So up first is osteomyelitis. We think infection. So essentially what happens, my bony tissue got infected. And this is a really, really severe issue. It can be from the body, from the bloodstream, or contagious. Um, but really what happens is this infection attacks the bone, causes these massive inflammatory changes, and lots of pain and swelling in the patient. 
Additionally, you'll have this pain, but also those hallmark signs and symptoms of infection, such as fever, chills, um, et cetera. We diagnose this uh, with an MRI. And unfortunately, these patients will require lots of antibiotics for a long time. If they require it for um, a long time, they're probably going to do a PIC line. Now, our focus is going to be on PIC line care, doing those kind of core hexidine baths. It's a sterile, it's sterile technique. This goes directly into the bloodstream. Um, so we're going to focus a lot on our PIC line care. These patients are having some some chronic issues and, and they're going to be on contact precautions as well because like I, um, on the slide earlier usually these infections are like your MRSA, your staph, etc. Just, just very very severe problems, okay? All right. These are some of our complications of our bone disorders that I, I just wanted to talk briefly about. Um, these are complications of musculoskeletal problems and I need honestly treatment. Um, so when we talk about compartment syndrome, this is what happens when my patient presents with severe pain and lack of blood flow to that um, extremity. They'll have decreased perfusion, so you're gonna have a hard time feeling a pulse. Um, and essentially, it's just this lack of blood flow is caused by the buildup of pressure. Usually, they will require a fasciotomy, and if not corrected soon enough, an amputation. So, what you guys need to know are the the um, the five P's of compartment syndrome: your pain, your pallor, your pulselessness, your paresthesias and paralysis okay this is what you guys need to know crest syndrome this is what happens when my body starts breaking down muscle usually from trauma and that kind of goes through the body and the body has a really hard time breaking down our muscle cells we learned a long time ago rhabdomyolysis um they're quite toxic so when someone has crest syndrome Yes, the muscles were broken down and damaged, but we're starting to see some renal, acute renal failure or some acute renal issues. And that is what crush syndrome is. Fat embolus syndrome, you guys need to know. This is what happens very, very common in hip fractures um, where kind of the bone marrow releases fat into the bloodstream. What happens when fat gets into the bloodstream? It can get stuck places. You have your fat embolus syndrome, okay? Um, these patients, you'll start to see hypoxia, dyspnea, tachypnea. But what's really interesting about fat embolus syndrome is you'll start to see a petechial rash on the chest. And you kind of see like, oh, well, you know, fat embolus syndrome, a lot of the signs and symptoms are similar to like a DVT or a stroke or a pulmonary embolism because, yes, we have a, a, a clot, a thrombus of, of some sort, but what's particular about fat embolism syndrome? It is the petechial rash, usually preceded by a patient that had a hip fracture and they just had surgery. Um, amputations, um, they're not talked about too much. Ideally, if your patient requires an amputation, it's usually because of a lot of trauma to the area, but our goal is to preserve the knee joint, um, just because it's going to be a lot easier for them to, you know, fit some, um, orthotic devices, things like that. Um, unfortunately though, when you have an amputation, you have lots of bleeding. Um, so our major, or honestly, our major concern is going to be bleeds and infections because we now have this open area. Usually the bone kind of gets cut, you know, in half. And, and like we just talked about osteomyelitis. So this is, this is how everything comes full circle. Um, a really big thing these patients do report on is some phantom limb pain. It's important to let them know that this is an expected finding. It's going to decrease over time. And we actually can give them some stuff to help with the phantom limb pain, um, such as gabapentin, calcitonin, propranolol. This is more of a nerve pain. So we're going to give more of our psychiatric medications that you guys are learning about. Okay. It's also really important to note that we do neurovascular checks. We're checking the extremity. We're properly positioning them. We're properly wrapping them. 
etc. The knee injuries, on the other hand, again, there's lots of different types of trauma. We're not going to go into it too much. Just know lots of different risk factors. And usually the signs and symptoms are the same. You'll hear like some grating. You'll see some swelling. You'll feel some heatness, lots of pain, etc. For our knees injuries, we use our rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevate. That's usually what we do for a lot of our musculoskeletal problems is this rest, ice, compression, elevate. Remember that with ice and heat, we want to alternate every 20 minutes, have a break in between, and we never, um, for lack of better word, go naked. We never put direct ice onto the skin. We never put direct heat onto the skin. We always make sure that we have a towel of some sort that kind of prevents that. Okay, we always need to make sure we're doing frequent neurovascular assessments distal to the injury. Up next is our carpal tunnel syndrome. This is more of a nerve issue. My median nerve gets compressed, which leads to some pain, numbness, etc. These patients will have a positive Phelan's test and a positive Tinnell's test. I encourage you to kind of look up the videos on those. They are very, very helpful. Um, but you'll just, these patients have a lot of pain in this, this wrist joint, even when you're doing range of motion, even if you're putting a blood pressure cuff on, a tourniquet, etc. And they'll just have, have reduced grip strength, reduced fine motor skill of that affected hand. What can we do? We can give some NSAIDs for the pain, maybe some corticosteroids to reduce some swelling, um, which might be contributing to the compression. Lots of complementary and alternative um, methods. We can do acupuncture, acupressure, things like that, laser therapy, and finally nerve decompression surgery. And like I've kind of talked about for everything in, in this realm of nursing, we're doing neurovascular tests, assessing what's the temperature of the skin, what's the color of it, do they still have a good capillary refill, can I feel a pulse? Those are really what need, we need to be focusing on. Um, with our rotator cuff injury, lots of different causes, but no matter what, these patients are going to be complaining of a lot of pain. They'll have a hard time kind of moving, kind of moving it out, etc. Weakness with the drop arm test. They're really not going to be able to kind of support it. It's just going to go a little bit limp. Um, treatment's dependent on the severity. If it's partial, maybe we can give them some, some, some pain meds, some ice, some rest. Remember that rice, that rest ice, compression, elevate. That's what we do for partial thickness stuff. Now, if they have a full thickness tear, they're probably going to require surgery, okay? All right, I have another practice question. Um, this is our select all that apply. So, we have an 87-year-old male client who had an open reduction internal fixation for a right fractured hip this morning. Before surgery, his wife of 50 years states that the client has been in excellent health and is mentally intact. He still works two days a week as an accountant and is completely independent in ADL. The nurse plans for the care to ensure his safety and quality post-op care. Which nursing actions would the nurse include in his plan of care for today? So if you're caring for this patient, what are we going to do for him? What do we think we're going to do for this patient? And I promise this is our last practice question. What are we going to do? And what are we most concerned about? Okay, good, good. B and G are, are, are true. So we see, very good. So I see A, B, C, G, and H. A, B, C, 
g and h. So, what do we think about? Do we think we'd assess their ability to ambulate with a cane? Do you think that might be a good idea? Might not. Immediately post-op, we probably don't want to be having them ambulate, especially with a cane post-op, not on the same day. You're very right, very good. Um, what about assessing their swallowing ability? Do you think that's something important to do after a post-operative post procedure? What do we know they use a lot of? Absolutely, Julia, yes, due to the anesthesia. We need to assess their ability to swallow. They're probably gonna require follow-up meds, probably some pain meds, but they just underwent a pretty big procedure. We need to establish their airway. Are they able to swallow? We're gonna do a little bit of a bedside swallow study on these patients, which we as the nurses can do. You just give them a spoonful of water, see if they can swallow it, then you give them a cup and see if they can swallow the cup, okay? Um, ideally, um, we also want to encourage frequent oral care on these patients. Yep, frequent oral care. We don't want them aspirating. We don't want anything of the sort. So very good job. You guys did really well. It is A, B, C, E, F, G, and H. Really, the only thing we want to have them do is ambulate with that cane right after. Probably not the best. Very good. So now we're going to get in our end of life care. So essentially, what are our goals for care? We really want to promote a death with dignity and we want to minimize suffering. Um, you know, if your patient is on high doses of morphine, high doses of opioids, and they start having some respiratory distress, we're going to reduce the morphine. Why? We know morphine contributes to that respiratory distress. Um, so it's just kind of all about really assessing your patient. I don't know if anyone's had the opportunity to do palliative care on a patient, postmortem care on a patient, things like that. But it's quite an amazing learning opportunity, I will say. Um, at the end of the day, we're respecting their wishes, whether it be advanced directives, cultural, spiritual, religious, et cetera. It's kind of our, our role as, as the nurse. Um, additionally, when we're talking about our postmortem care, um, really, if the family wants to stay, you let them stay. What's the role of the nurse? We make sure all the invasive lines are out. We make sure their IVs are out, their catheters are out. We clean them up a little bit. We make sure that on their toe, we put their, their name tag. On their wrist, we put the name tag. And on the bag, we put, put the name tag, okay? Um, one thing I do wanna talk about, Withdrawing life-sustaining measures is okay. That's what we call comfort measures only, okay? It is not the same as an assisted suicide. Um, lots of kind of symptoms associated with death and dying. Really, it's most important for pain. We treat their pain. If your patient's very weak, we're probably gonna put in a Foley so they're not getting up to the chair. Mouth care is really important. They're gonna have a hard time, you know, with breathing. Their lips will become chapped, et cetera. Breathlessness and dizzy, dyspnea, please treat the underlying cause. Um, if someone is having lots of, you know, opioids, that might be what's contributing to their breathlessness and their respiratory distress. So we might need to, to fix the dose of that. Um, and really, we're just monitoring for the agitation, nausea, vomiting, seizures, suffering. Um, Etc. So I'll, I'll let you guys look over this slide. Now we get to talk about emergency and trauma. So this is kind of if you want to be an ER nurse, if you would like to be a trauma nurse, what are some qualities you need? Who are you really kind of working with? And, and I, I did make this slide just for you guys, um, because I know a lot of people are interested in ER, they're interested in trauma, things like that. This is kind of just what 
decomposes uh, life in the ER or life as an ER nurse, what you're seeing a lot of, et cetera. We're going to focus more on priority and triage. So yes, while we do see a lot of patients that come in with fever um, and, you know, maybe superficial injuries, we're probably going to prioritize the patient with persistent chest pain first. So a lot of our emergency focus is going to be prioritization, okay? So this is kind of how we're going to prioritize. Are they emergent, urgent, or non-urgent? So if someone's complaining of any difficulty breathing, any chest pain, massive bleeding, your stroke alerts, they are who you're going to treat first. So if you have a, pro if you have a question um, that's saying, here's five patients, you have, you're taking care of four beds in the ER, who are you going to treat first? Who are you going to treat second? Who are you going to treat third? Who are you going to treat fourth? You kind of got to look, are they level one? Are they urgent? Are they non-urgent? What's going on? So remember, when emergent, think emergency. We're talking about urgent, meaning we do want to step it up a little bit. You know, that severe pain, severe tissue trauma, maybe some dislocated shoulders. We do want to get that quickly, but our chest pain and difficulty breathing are going to trump that, okay? Um, non-urgent, these are things that usually can be seen in fast track. Um, some contents of trauma, we've got different types of trauma centers, um, but really no matter where the patient is at, we want to focus on managing the injury, doing some recovery, and we want them to have a productive role in society. They might not be able to return to optimal function, but um, we want to really kind of get them to where they can still live a relatively normal life, okay? All right, this is what we really, really need to hone in on, okay? The trauma system. What is our primary versus our secondary survey? So primary, think A, B, C, D, okay? And E. Airway, cervical, spine, we always do this first. We have to maintain a patent airway before we give them some oxygen. So um, I had a question like this, um, I was just doing some practice ATI stuff to get ready for my NCLEX, but it was, what do you do first or, or, or put them in the order? Do you suction the patient's um, throat or do you put a nasal cannula on them first? And the answer was actually suction their throat because that's our airway. We need to maintain a patent airway. Um, so if someone has a really low Glasgow coma scale and they're having a hard time breathing on their own, we're going to have to intubate them first. We make sure that we get a C collar in the patient because remember, any injuries above, I think it's like that C4, um, they, they won't be able to breathe on their own. Okay. Up next is breathing. Now we can use our Ambu bags, our nasal cannula, et cetera. Circulation, this is CPR, get some fluids hung. However, a little caveat. If someone is having a massive hemorrhage, massive trauma, massive bleeding, we have to take care of the bleeding before we start CPR or before we start bagging them or anything like that. Why? If we don't stop the bleed, we can do CPR all we want. We can give them as much oxygen as they want. Eventually, their pressure is going to bottom out and they're, they're going to die. So in the event you have severe bleeding, we take care of that first. Then we can assess for disability. This is when we're doing our neurostatus, Glasgow Coma Scale. And finally, exposure. We are going to remove their clothing and we're going to turn them, if they can, turn them on their back so we can get a full look at everything that happened. Okay? Um, so that's why we got to get them, get their clothes off and everything like that. Our secondary survey, now we do our full head to toe that we're doing in our. Um, clinicals, that quick 10-minute assessment we always talk about. That's more of our secondary survey. Any other in issues, maybe starting a catheter, uh, starting an IV, doing like GI tubes, splinting, all of that's more of our secondary portion of everything. And last but not least, we're going to talk about some common environmental emergencies. So, what assessment should be doing specifically focusing on safety and what are some different treatment types? So when we're talking about heat stroke and heat exhaustion, although they do sound pretty similar, um, heat exhaustion is more of a symptomatic situation um, when someone's kind of just overheating, they lost a lot of sodium. Heat stroke, on the other hand, this is more of our medical emergency. My body 
can no longer thermoregulate itself. The reason heat exhaustion is more symptomatic is because the body's trying to regulate everything. When we get to heat stroke, the body's unable to do that. We'll start seeing some mental status changes, okay? What will we also see in heat stroke? We'll see elevated troponins. Troponins are meaning that my organs are being damaged, okay? And their body temp can get above 104. More of our, our heat our heat stroke, we can give them some saline, some cooling backs, and some rehydration. We give them electrolyte drinks, not lots of water. Remember, with our heat stroke, they lost a lot of sodium. If we just give them more water, it's going to put them further into hyponatremia. What happens if they're severely hyponatremic? They can have seizures. So these patients will probably be on seizure precautions. Um, for your heat stroke, we're going to need to do some quick, 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 rapid recooling, um, but only up until 102 degrees. We don't want to get them too cold, okay? Um, we avoid antipyretics and aspirin. Why? Because they are overheated due to an environmental factor, not a normal pathophysiological factor. That's why we're going to avoid those antipyretic medications. We all know about hypothermia, the body temperature dips below, um, but it's really important to note that if someone has severe hypothermia and they are not alert, they are not oriented, they've kind of gone into this coma-like state, we have to rewarm them. We are physically not able to assess their neurological status until we rewarm these patients because when the body gets cold, it shuts off. There's no way we can effectively do a neuro check on someone who is hypothermic. Okay? Keep in mind, what happens when you're cold? Everything is slowed. So we don't want to be pushing too many meds into these patients because the body's metabolism is also slowed. Our excretion is slowed. Everything is slowed. So we can build up to toxic doses pretty darn high. So if your patient comes into the ED, um, with hypothermia, immediately get them in some warm, dry clothing, um, and really we're, we're monitoring cardiac all the way. Okay. Up next is snake bites. Essentially for any of our snake, tick, arthropod bites, we want to be making sure we mark the area and we're doing neurovascular assessment. So please circle the area and please feel for a pulse, palpate the temperature, um, do your capillary refills, all the sorts. Specifically with our snake bites, we need to be doing thorough respiratory assessments. So if someone has any sort of kind of venom, we do two large bore IVs and we're gonna try to flush it out. Um, if we can't administer antivenom, that is what we can do. But honestly, I'd focus more on our wound care. We mark, we measure, record. Um, and contact poison control because they're going to be our, our best help in this type of situation. Same thing with our arthropods. These are our little friends with little legs. Um, again, we're really doing the same thing. We're assessing the skin. Um, if, uh, again, still doing respiratory assessments. Um, we're going to do tetanus prophylaxis just with these bites. Um, but also, why might we want to be cautious with opioids and benzodiazepines in these patients? Whether it be a snake bite or a tick or any sort of insect, um, we know that with poisons and venoms, they can cause some respiratory depression. They can cause some um, respiratory issues. We don't want to further make that worse. Okay. And if the patient, let's say, was stung by a bee or um, spider, tick, bee, et cetera, if they are allergic, have them carry an EpiPen. All right. Now we have our altitude. Um, last but not least, we have our altitude-related illnesses. So essentially what happens is as the patient goes higher up on the mountain, um, they have some, some altitude sickness because the partial pressure of O2 is low. So we have our acute mountain sickness, high altitude cerebral edema, and high altitude pulmonary edema. So just kind of look at the names and that can help you figure out what might be going on. So no matter what is going on, the first step is have the patient descend to a lower altitude. Um, if they are a frequent avid hiker, they can do some 
Diamox beforehand um, just to prepare. But um, usually our acute mountain sickness is pretty mild. We can treat it with some dexamethasone. Um, but when we start seeing our haste and our hape, we have a lot more issues. For example, with our haste, we have think more mental status. With our hape, think more respiratory issues. So if the patient's having respiratory issues, we got to treat those respiratory issues, whether it be, you know, administering bronchodilator, whether it be giving them oxygen, whatever the case may be. And ephedipine also helps a lot with pulmonary issues. Um, really with our haste, we'll have more mental status changes. We can kind of give some dexamethasone to help. Decadron just is a really good drug for, and I couldn't really tell you why, um, but it is our drug of choice for our haste. Lots of different drugs have lots of different functions, which is quite um, cool to see. And then now we have our drowning. Um, big picture for drowning is even after we've resuscitated someone or pulled someone out of the water, they could have choked on some of the water. The water could have been gross and gunky and full of contaminants. So we might need to be starting them on some broad spectrum antibiotics. But really assess your patient. Did they drown and they just came into the ED because now they're having some chest pain? Or were they active drowning, came in through the ED, came in an ambulance, or doing active CPR? If it's active CPR, then we're going to do CPR and defibrillation. Um, gastric decompression, if they've inhaled and they've swallowed a lot of water, ET tubes. But really, we're, we're assessing severity. We're assessing what's going on in these patients, okay? A lot of our drowning is going to focus on prevention. So that is all I have for you guys. If anyone has any questions,